in the moment, you know, I was just on my journey as a professional triathlete, but I had already reached this sort of internal tipping point where I knew that triathlon would not be the end all be all for me. I saw what it took for Tim to win Hawaii. It was sacrifice at the highest level, singular focus at the highest level, marriage barely making it, right? You don't have time for anything when you're going after a world championship, right? And I knew that for this sport, I was not willing to give that. And I also knew that for me to feel a little more complete or satisfied or fulfilled or whatever the word is, I needed people around me. I am like the epitome of an extrovert. I, if no one's around, my energy will dwindle till it's gone. Like I thrive on being around other people and having great conversations, having physical experiences, whatever. So I had already stumbled upon this idea for what later became skirt sports. And I was working on this idea to make the first ever running skirt. And so prior and leading up to Ironman, I was already being fueled by something else. That was Nicole DeBoom, and this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Welcome to episode 109 of the YTP. I'm Jess, your host, and I'm recording this on the Monday morning the day after our head coach, BJ, ran himself into sixth place at Ironman Boulder. Oh my God. So I'm a little, I'm a little fried right now, but we are on such a high. It was super exciting to see him moving up in his age group rankings with every checkpoint of the day. His execution was impeccable and his choices were so incredibly smart. So you guys were sitting down today to smack down the race with BJ and our buddy Troy, two-time YTP guest favorite, who also happened to claim second in his age group yesterday. And I just can't wait to pull the deets out because I've talked to both of them and I just, oh, it's going to be a great show. These guys raced like warriors yesterday in 90 plus degree heat on a super tough course. Ironman Boulder was not on the schedule for us, but after BJ came off so strong from a great race in Santa Rosa, we both could hear Boulder calling us. And that's the thing, people, we must stay on high alert for when the plan changes and the signs come in because we never know what is waiting for us. If our guest today did not cut a run short in 2003 to scribble her inspiration onto paper after seeing her reflection in a storefront window, who knows when we would have seen the first ever running skirt. But thanks to her intuitive drive and frankly for being fed up with feeling like she looked like a boy in her training and racing gear, Nicole Debu moved forward and put her inspiration into action. In 2004, she won Ironman Wisconsin wearing a prototype skirt, and three days later, she founded Skirt Sports. Nicole has been an athlete her entire life. She qualified for the Olympic trials at the age of 16 and the 100-meter breaststroke, and although she didn't make the Olympic team, she did become a highly recruited college athlete. She swam for Yale University, and when she graduated, she said goodbye to her swimming career. Until that is, she discovered triathlon. Following the breadcrumbs of her competition, she found herself sitting next to a very cute boy named Tim DeBoom on a flight to the 1995 ITU World Championships. A year later, they were married. Tim went on to win the Hawaii Ironman twice in 2001 and 2002. And today, Nicole continues to lead the charge on empowering women through skirt sports and all that falls under the skirt sport umbrella. She is not just an apparel company. She has her Running Start nonprofit, skirt sports running races, and her Running This World podcast, which today's podcast will also be an episode on Nicole's show. So the night before we recorded this, Nicole had the idea of interviewing each other, just letting the topics drop and see where they go. I have to say this may be one of my favorite episodes. We get an inside look into the philosophies of what runs the woman who is running this world. And I have to say, Nicole is not only a well-educated, on-point businesswoman, but she has some really strong intuitive guidance that allows her to constantly move forward. On the other side of the mic, Nicole asked BJ and I to dig in a little more about our minimalistic life, mindfulness, meditation, and why we never had children. So 
This is a cool convo. I am so grateful for all of our amazing guests like Nicole that open up and share for the benefit of the collective. So without another moment, let's dive in with entrepreneur, wife, mother, Ironman champion, and lead skirt in this race of life, Nicole DeBoom. I think the first one I listened to was Siri. Yeah, you said you were doing some recon mm-hmm. for your interview with yep. Siri. Yep. And you, you know, you have you stay in the world of yogi triathletes. Yeah. Tell me when we're on because I won't be chewing. We're on. Oh, great. Because <laughs> <laughs> I always have to be eating, right? And I'm so worried about you, and I want to push food on you. And You've been pushing food on us since, since we got we here. Got no, it. before. Because yeah, before no, you before, came, actually, I was asking you if you wanted breakfast. to join me for second breakfast. <laughs> but we've, yeah. we know all about second breakfast, and we've already had it. So we're doing we're doing good. What are you eating right now? Because that looks Yeah, this oh, looks okay. really good. Yeah, okay, awesome. so um, a couple years ago, I knew I needed to change up my diet. Because I was still eating like a pro triathlete, and I was like f- at least over 10 years out of that world, and then also a five year mom at that time, and bodies change, and metabolism change. So I did this year challenge where every other month I tried a new eating philosophy. So I don't call them diets, they're eating philosophies. I did gluten free one month, and I would take a month off like correct, <laughs> whatever. I did no dessert one month, and it was like the worst month of my life. And so I, that, that one doesn't yeah. work for you. No, I was like cheating. I created this rule that you couldn't eat something sweet after dinner. So I would eat my chocolate in the day. I was eating the desserts before <laughs> dinner or I was like pushing dinner really late. So I wouldn't. Anyway, um, but I ended the year on Rip Esselstyn's Engine 2 28 day shakeout, you know. And it gets you all the way down to not only being uh, vegan, but also low, low fat, basically. So you're eating for your highest heart health. So it, I felt absolutely amazing. It was like on the honeymoon, right? I couldn't sustain the like low fat part. So I'm like a big nut butter eater and all that jazz. We're nut, yeah, full on preaching. nut mm-hmm. butter nut freaks. addicts. Like nut freaky. Um, so anyway, this morning I've, I've actually continued. So that's the one that stuck of all the eating philosophy. I love how you did this because we always say to people, you know, it's, it's so personal and you have, like, we will answer all your questions because we found the eating philosophy that works incredible for us. We get blood work every year to back up, you know, what we work with inside tracker but you have to find out what works. And I love the way you did it. Well, you what's love cool, the way you did it. You and just I, tried it all. You have to. It's like uh, eating shopping, eating philosophy shopping, right? I was going out <laughs> just shopping the different diets out there. And um, on RIPS, I got my blood before and after. And it was, I was a healthy person, but there was a clear level of improvement. And what RIP would call being like your heart attack proof now. Because look, your cholesterol is down at like 140 now or whatever. And your, your good numbers are where they need to be. And your bad numbers are no, no longer bad. They're just not an issue. Right. Triglycerides, and like totally. cholesterol. It's just a non-issue. It is. And you know what I hate about a lot of the diets that are out there that are a little more commercial is people are often like, how do you feel? <laughs> and that's great. Like you should feel better. But that doesn't necessarily give you or it didn't give me enough data to make me understand that feeling better meant something internally. Yeah, I like that. So like Inside Tracker always uses, I love their their hashtag. tagline or their hashtag is take a selfie from the inside. What, so what is this Inside Tracker? Oh, oh. do you know Inside Tracker? Because, you know, we're interviewing each other today. Yeah, we are. <laughs> this is dueling podcasts I know, right this I is so this. cool. We're on. We're doing two podcasts. Oh, so we're doing... by the way, what? yeah, I'm Nicole DeBoom from yeah. Run This World. Hey, everyone. <laughs> How you doing today? And I'm Jess Gumkowski. And BJ Gumkowski. <laughs> and we are Yogi Triathlete. I love it. We should team up more often. I know. You're running this world, and we're on a mission to create a better world, so... Done and done. Done. There's there's no We're need done. for any other podcast <laughs> in the universe. So, well, yeah, so sorry, Malcolm Gladwell. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. Rich whatever. Roll, whatever. <laughs> we got them. I don't um, have Rich Roll's vocabulary. Yeah, he's he's a lawyer. Look, though. I'm already speechless. He's <laughs> what? <laughs> Wicked smart. <laughs> Uh, so you guys, we met so, so many years ago. So many. And actually, I'm looking over here at the, oh, um, God. the skirt chaser flyer. And that's from 2008. Was that the first? Yeah. First official. First official. So we met, we met 
shortly after you won Ironman Wisconsin mm-hmm. in a skirt. Yep, that was 2004. And September BJ, 12th, BJ is actually the one that brought me to you because he there was an article about tricks, right? Which was skirts spelled backwards, yes. which was like the original. That was the original skirt was the trick skirt, the marathon. Oh no, the um, the transition girl. Oh yeah, yeah. So you remember, and the reason you oh, remember yeah. is because you were in our inaugural class of skirt sports ambassadors. I was, I was so amazing, and that's how I met you know Mary Knott, who's talk about yes. running this world. And we had her on the podcast, and Christina, mm-hmm. uh, we're interviewing her on Monday. I can't wait. She's still a ball oh, great. of just amazing energy cool. and courage, and she's Kelly. just so awesome. Kelly. Yes. Kelly lives in Australia now. Totally. And, and, you know, here's the deal, though. This was well over 10 years ago, almost 15 years ago, that I won that race, and 10 years ago since we connected, like, you know, in skirt sports sense, but our lives are so dramatically different. Do you ever think about your life in decades? I oh, mean, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And we were just thinking about that as we, we took the hill coming into Boulder. Mm-hmm. And if we had stayed in Boulder, like... We were what, playing what, this, like, yeah. What, what would have happened? Like, what would our life have looked like? Would I still be like? a web designer guy? Would I still be, like, doing therapist? massage? And I probably would have had a kid. And we were just kind of and like... Where would we have lived? We were maybe back at our town home in uh, Tantra. Yeah, like, would we have had this hit to minimize <laughs> as crazy as we minimized? Because we had three places at that point. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Well, and what if I had left and minimized my life? I'd right. probably be divorced. I wouldn't have my kid. I don't know. What would we be doing? And that's the what would game. Who cares? I know. Right. I remember here one time you came in for a massage. Like, your massage therapist was in Kona. Mm. And you came in and had a session with me. And I remember you being like... So what's up? You having a kid or what? <laughs> should, should we have kids or what? <laughs> Did I say should we have kids or should you have kids? Like you and me, like oh. meaning should, should we <laughs> like have together, kids or what? No, like at the like, same time? Kind of like right. what are we doing? Like right. am I gonna have a kid or am I not gonna? Like we were kind of just discovering well, that, and I was like, I don't know. Let's talk about it because yeah. I said no way at that time, it and was I a said no way. No way. It was a no way on both ends. And now you've got a kid, and now, now I have a six year old, and you guys could barely walk through the house. One child has like decimated <laughs> every floor. Her Legos. name is Wilder. Yes. So she's living up to it. And totally. And um, and my my vision just shifted one, you know, slowly, probably over time. But part of it was that I wasn't sure Tim and I could have a kid together because Tim was living in a very self-centered world for a really long time. He fully admits to it. He's written articles about it. And there was no way that I could see him giving of himself to create another life and then be an active parent. And he couldn't either. And when I was racing, you know, full time, I couldn't envision that either. Well, it's really interesting that you see, you saw that in him because, you know, in the mindfulness world, like it's, we we just see that as projection. Like everyone in our life is a mirror. So what we see in other people is actually what is within us. I think I've heard you talk about this with Siri Lindley. <laughs> yeah. And I think I've actually possibly stolen it in a podcast or two. You're I love so it. Wise. Share it. Yeah. Share yeah. It. No, yeah, it's because really you true. were in a self-centered sport for I many years. Totally. You know, you and were at then the top. Not only sport, like I started skirt sports and that was also a very self-centered pursuit that didn't allow for even like a fulfilling marriage. You know, it was this Living in a world of singular focus is hard to break. You interview a lot of people in worlds of singular focus. They can put almost all their energy into one thing, right? But that's not realistic for most of the world. And that's when they get into this whole thing of balance and, you know, this like life, work, blah, Mm -hmm. balance. And that's a whole nother topic. But like when you're in singular focus and then you decide to make a decision to expand that focus... That is quite a transition. Well, because you have to, you have to let go of your identity. Yes. To open up, like we we have a, we say this all the time. This was like a theme when we, you know, were homeless on the road for six months. Was all channels open, all channels Everything. open. Where we would all stay, where we would visit, who we interacted with, where we were gonna live. Like we were prepared. For those of you that don't know, in 2016 we sold our dream house, got rid of everything we owned. We got to that point in our life that you're supposed to be at as an American couple. We could afford our life. We were putting money in the bank and we were choking on it all and we had to get out. It was like, it was suffocating. And so we moved into our Honda Fit with our dog Clark and hit the road with no plan of where we were going to live. 
what we were going to do. And we were being, we were prepared to be taken off the road at any point and live wherever, even though we had a vision of being in California, which is where we ended okay. up. I'm watching you. Where's my phone? I need to have this on video. <laughs> Should have gotten this like love moment. It was like a love mm. bubble surrounded oh. you. I'm not kidding. Like there's not only a leap of faith that needs to happen and a letting go of your identity, but like you have to come together stronger than ever. Huge. And that's actually what happens when you have a kid too. I think that's my experience. Because I'm thinking that same thing. You had a kid by leaving. We had a kid. Right. We oh, had yeah, a kid. That's, yeah, that's great. Because yeah. when you when you bring something that massive into your life, whether it's moving into your Honda Fit at 44 years old or having a child, right? Like you realize that that child is going to show you who you are like nothing else. Mm -hmm. Like that that tour that we took, we called it the Ride the High Vibe Tour because our our intention was to raise awareness that living a more vibrant life is within reach for everyone. Whether that's having a green smoothie, cleaning out your linen closet, um, putting on a pair of shoes and running run. to the yeah. mailbox, whatever it is, you can bring more vibrancy into your life. And what happened with us is like, I don't know, it was maybe like 15 minutes into the six month, 7,000 mile ride. And I was like, whoa, I got rid of everything except for myself. <sighs> oh my God. And that's I bet you that's heavy. what Wilder did for you too. She showed you guys who you were. Well, she did, but it took a while to get there because what happened, her, this was my experience. I don't know how it happens for other people, but as soon as you get pregnant, it's suddenly not about you anymore. It is about you, but as like a body. So that's the last time in my life that I like took such good care of myself. Tons of massage, acupuncture. I napped. I took three hour naps on the couch and I was still working. Like, I don't even know how I was doing anything else except for like pamper myself. I felt like I was on like a nine month spa tour, right? That's awesome. Because you're just trying to make sure that this, for me, aging body, 39, was going to be okay having a baby. You were making a human. Making a human. And then you have the baby, which everyone's got hilarious stories about, you know, how their baby finally came to be, but they come out and suddenly there's a baby. And then it's not, you're still not thinking about you anymore. You're and this is where I think people get lost because they, it takes them many years to finally step out of caretaking mode and realize like, Oh, wait, who am I again? Because I was a person, then I became a vessel to have a baby. Then I had a baby. Then I became the mom making sure that my baby was okay. And now you, you know, yes, eventually you have to dig deep again to figure out who you are. And often through painful moments of depression or who knows, trying to refine yourself, your, your interests change. And to the relationship point, I find that a lot of couples will really come together right when the baby, it's like a honeymoon period. You're exhausted. You've got no sleep. You guys are, you have to come together as a team. I got the bottle. I got the feeding. I've got the diapers. You know, we're making it happen. But then at some point, like exhaustion sets in like chronic fatigue, you know, and you kind of wake up and then, then the tension starts with your partner and you realize like, oh my gosh, we have to form an entirely new family yeah. identity, mm -hmm. partnership, et cetera. So that's when you really figure out who you are today. Oh yeah, not who you were, but who you are now. And there's probably still a fight too, because you want to hang on to those that old files of like who you were. Like, oh my god, that's who I am. I've been there totally. before. You guys know this because yeah, you've gone through. Yeah, it's trying we've, to strip away that identity. You get so much, so much attachment. You're yeah. so attached to it, and and sometimes you can't see it. And that's why the partner is such a good thing because they have they're there as a guide. They don't always interject to kind of like ha let you have your experience. Yeah, but then eventually you start to like gravitate out of it. Like you pull yourself out. Well, and think about it. You can't, we opened up this part of the conversation with you going, would I still be that like digital marketing dude? And like you had already, you had that identity. And at what point did you let it go? Was it the minute you left or was it the 15 minutes in when you, did you say how many minutes I feel like in? you're still letting that go. Yeah. I'm still, I'm, st I, it's like, it's going into those old files. Like, can I do, take on this project? I'm like, well. Could probably because I it's just falling into that old habit. Whereas yeah. I should be putting all my energy into coaching and and growing these apps because our team is growing like like and crazy. And they're not just coming for <laughs> no. training. Like training is the last thing we talk about. It's like life coaching. Right. Life coaching. How can you take these tools that you're learning in training and apply them to life? Like 
you're all you, you and Tim did is preparing you for these years with Wilder and what's going to happen from yeah. now on. And you're right. And, and, but you don't realize it when you're in it, when you're right. in it, you're just surviving a lot of the time. And you know, in a relationship, like everybody probably looks at you too. And they're like, Oh my God, those two are amazing. They're like best friends. And everybody wants to be best friends. Like with their spouse and have that story. He's my best friend, you know? <laughs> and I mean, Tim's my person, you know, I don't know if like he's my best friend. I will talk to him about anything, but we have different kinds of tensions and issues than my actual best friend who I don't live with and sleep with and do intimate things with, you know, <laughs> like, so it's just different. And, um, I actually don't know where I was going with that, but I'm complimenting you on your ability to like continue to at least be conscious and aware of your relationship together through change. Yeah. And I can tell you that w that perception of like us being best friends, like it's not bullshit. We, <laughs> we sometimes just laugh at you. Like the, I can't tell you how many times it happens. Like I'll be like on the one side of the breakfast bar and BJ will be in the kitchen and he'll just look at me and go, do you ever think about how much time we spend together? I'm like, I know, it's like crazy. And he's like, and we're not sick of each other. I mean, we've been together for over 20 years, but we've, we have gone deep. This is the key, everyone. Go deep within yourself for healing, right? I don't look to BJ to complete me, save me, carry my burdens or irritate like you irritating me. me like you are when it when you all think about it it's yeah he's, back to you it's back to you he's right. not here for me to blame my feelings on he i don't hold him responsible for making me feel a certain way and i think it's the same thing and absolutely it wasn't yeah. until we both started meditating and you know not just meditating but taking that practice off the cushion and through our entire life where the clarity just gets so big, the space between the thoughts in your head, the emotions that want to attach to those thoughts, and then where, where we're sitting, it's like we're sitting in the hub of the wheel all the time. And the thoughts and the roles that we play and the identities and all of that are the spokes. And then the wheel, the tire is like, that's our life just going round and round and round. But we've developed this ability through meditation and mindfulness to always sit in the hub. We got to, I, I, you got to, we're doing a breakout meditation session after this. I like I, it's it. time for me. I avoided it for so many I years. I definitely avoided it. I was like, really, I'm going to become like a sober, vegan, oh, yes. bolder <laughs> meditator. I can't stand like, that person. That's so Boring. embarrassing. Boring. I'm yeah. like so... the last one anyone wants to like to a party. Oh, yeah. um, oh, just so you know, nobody invites us anyway. <laughs> they just, nobody, the, the oh invites stopped a while ago. The invites definitely stopped when we started meditating. Like, right. we don't get invited anywhere unless it's like a <laughs> lunar rhythm circle, you know, something like that, like, but, which so is beautiful awesome. and true for... But that's the progression. That's totally the progression. But I don't care. I have yeah. no desire to, like... Go to a bar and oh God. drink up. I want to feel good the next day. Yeah, like, like, I but I, up. oh man. When Wait, I have you guys, are you sober? You haven't, you don't drink? Pre, I mean, last night my friend was having a glass of wine. So I was like, all right, I'll have a glass. Like I, I've been kind of like craving like a sip of white wine for mm -hmm. months. And so she poured me like maybe a little bit less than a half a glass. And there's like half of that left on the counter. And she's like, you're going to finish this? I'm like, I'll put an ice cube in it and have it tonight. She's, <laughs> she's like... like Okay, She's I like, have that's an eighty dollar bottle yeah, of wine. Know, you might want to like, appreciate it. And by the way, I drink that whole thing in one sip. Oh, um, which you know, I used to pound it. I was a mm -hmm. three glass of wine, three glass of wine a night girl. Mm -hmm. That's that, almost a bottle. That used to say, "I have a glass of wine a night." Yeah, and then I remember one day I yeah. went to the doctor and I was like, "Fuck this." Can I swear on your podcast? Oh, yeah. Because I know I we'll can be, swear uh, on my what, what do we call it when it's... Um, explicit. Explicit. Yeah. But I remember being We're in the doctor's there. office one day and being like, I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm not going to say I have one glass of wine a night. I'm going to say I have three glasses of wine a night. Right, because you were lying. And that's actually lying. a sign that you're hiding something, yes. which is, you know, one of the steps towards having like a real problem. Yeah. So, and I, when I first started meditating, I was like, all right, listen, I know like these gurus mm -hmm. and sages and they say it changes your life but here's the deal i'm going to stay in control and i'm going to use this meditation thing so i can sleep better at night and not be such a bitch um and not like freak out and slam my 
computer down and break the screen. I'm not gonna do those things anymore, so that's how I'm gonna use meditation, but I'm still gonna drink wine, I'm still gonna swear, and I'm gonna keep my ego, because I really like it. I love this. <laughs> and the last thing I'm gonna be is a sober yoga teacher. <laughs> That, you know, that eats like plants. that eats plants. Like and that's meditates. not going to be me. Right. And it's, right. you know, okay. Just never say never. The last thing I think of when I think of the word bitch <laughs> is Jessica Gumpkowski. Well, it was, it, it was the inside. It was the inside crazy yeah. that I did a really good job of not letting a lot of people see. I think BJ saw some of my crazy. I've seen both sides. Absolutely, but yeah. I always say nobody knew, nobody knows how crazy I was except for me. Yeah. And I think so many people can relate to that. Yeah. Holy cow! You know, you, totally. I, I know we're just like we're just rocking this podcast right now. We're going, yeah, we're just we're hitting, going subject to subject, subject, and we're gonna come back matter, to that amazing food that you're eating. So oh. we're gonna let everyone drool over that. Yeah. But, but first, I want to say I was just reading your article about anxiety oh, and yeah. depression in um, women's running, and um, you know, anxiety was something that I definitely dealt mm. with. You know, I grew up with a mom breathing into a brown paper bag and passing out on the floor, and. I used to have panic attacks and like, I get it. I get what it feels like to not be able to sit down. And, uh, and then feeling like, I I think we've all felt depression, you know? I mean, I don't know if I've ever labeled it that, but definitely like there was something that for me was like, I don't want to live like this anymore, you know? And like, I would look around and whether I was like just looking at the surface, I don't know, but the motivation of other people looking like they could enjoy a meal at a restaurant or just having fun or whatever. And I didn't feel like they were hiding things like I was hiding things. Well, and that's, I think that's a really good point, the hiding. So I, when I wrote this article, my, my biggest challenge was that I didn't want to feel like a fraud because I don't suffer from like depressive disorder or have like high anxiety. As a general, per, as a person in general, I am, I'm a pretty positive and happy person. I've had my downs. I've had crap happen that I've had to deal with, you know, and I have bad days. But what prompted me to write it was that I saw someone who was suffering and I put the word out to ask, is this something other people suffer from? And I was like, it, it just besieged with emails and um, posts about people who suffer from all levels of depression and anxiety for all kinds of reasons. And I thought, well, maybe I can dig into this a little. And that was <laughs> this <laughs> Just article. a little bit, because that's really how you get to the bottom of it. You're just going to, I'm just going to go, right. ju- I'm going to go subcutaneous. Right. <laughs> just like, just a little depression <laughs> going on. And it, you know, it's such a complex issue and it's so prevalent. And the, you know, what I had to do is focus on a few things. And one of the things that I found and that was very obvious was that people hide it because it's not visual. You're not an amputee. You're not limping. You're not hacking. You know, you you don't, you haven't lost your breasts, whatever. Like you can't tell that they're suffering from an actual disorder. Right. And so people hide it because there's stigma around it. And so when I knew you back when, and when you may say you suffered from anxiety, maybe even when I knew you 10 years ago, I would never have known because right. I saw you as one of the most vibrant, positive people. Well, that was, that part was very true too, but there was stuff brewing under the surface. Right. Right. And yeah. that, that's what it is. Like I've always had a super strong light and a huge amount of yeah. love to share in the world. But for me, um, and I think this has a lot to do with the hiding too, is vulnerability. I saw vulnerability. I would see it in other people and not think of it as a weakness, but I saw it as a weakness within me. You know, like I can do it all. I can, I can do it all. I can be that girl that does it all and she's positive and she's smiling all the time. And those smiles were real. They were never like, they were never fake. But when I went, when when what was brewing under the surface came out, I had no control over okay, it. Okay, what was, was brewing? All right, we're doing it. What was brewing? <laughs> yes. Not being good enough. Yeah. Not being good enough. You know, and I and and that took a while. But what did to that mean? To. Like what was your standard? Why were you who are you comparing to or what were you Everyone. comparing to? I mean, I think that's it didn't matter who we were I was comparing myself to the woman that was walking down the street with a smile on her face. Well, why can't I be that happy? She's smiling more than I'm smiling. Right. She's fake yeah, like, smiling more than I'm right. fake smiling. I mean, so I think as an athlete, like it was, it was partially, it was my unworthiness being hid by competitiveness. And I think like the greatest gift, I mean, I've won my age group and like, and I've, I've been on the podium and things like that, but 
but I was never like, it was never my path to really go hardcore into that. I, I really enjoyed the, the unraveling that sports allowed for me because it brought me down to this base layer of who I was. And I realized that the anxiety or the I'm not good enough was completely, um, would be washed away by the absolute strength and will and my ability to like get to the finish line of an Ironman. And I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's worthiness. Now, I hear a lot of people, like I've, I've worked with people with mindfulness and meditation and I've asked some folks before, like, what do you think this Ironman finish is going to do for you? And I've heard people say, it's going to make me believe in myself more. And I think that's like, it can be a double-edged sword, right? We can be setting ourselves up for, I think expectations ruin the future, right? That's what we think. And that's yeah, comes straight from our, our yoga teacher. Absolutely. Yeah. And detachment is yeah. really, really tough. But I think that this is where our minds can come in as really, really good friends because the mind is based on past experience as long as we allow ourselves to remember like, wait a minute, I was in like a sleeting downpour on a seven mile descent at Ironman Lake Placid and I survived that. I can do anything, you know, and those are moments. That's why I loved Ironman so much because it brought me moments where I didn't know if I could go on and I would go on and it showed me my strength. And so for me, that coupled with meditation and mindfulness, I was able to come out and what we focus on expands. So there was no more focus on the, the focus shifted from, I can do anything from I'm not good enough. And so over time that I'm not good enough fell away because I wasn't giving it fuel anymore. That is so okay, but this is years, people. This right. is not like a thirty but you, second. You're chance choosing right? to fuel, and I worked my ass off moments to create these neural pathways in my brain. Okay, you're gonna go in our bathroom after the <laughs> whatever you're gonna do in there. You can do. There is um, this little story, people. It's like a little piece of art, like kids draw, and then there's these really wise sayings, and there's this cartoonish picture of what looks kind of like a garden, and it's wilted. And it says something along the lines of, I used to water my garden, but it, it would only grow on negative thoughts. And one day I decided there, you know, to stop watering it and let it die. So it was this vibrant garden based on only negative thinking. And when you can shut that hose off, isn't that cool? Yeah. That's so cool because... I, I love that because why would you want to kill something that's right? That's so vibrant. Like, and a big part of you, right. and you've spent a lot of time nourishing the negative, the people, there are phases in our life where you just like talk about other people or you're just like doing things. But you that, don't notice it, right? No, you're on, you you're on autopilot. That's the yeah. space. That's, that's where that gap. most yes. people are living. They're living on the spokes. Uh -huh. They're living in the tire. Yeah. They're not living in the hub. Yeah. So that's what, what meditation that... gives you. It gets you into the hub. All right. Dang and you it. let those pants die. I know. Die. That's let what those... I said. I am just going. Like, to the next <laughs> level. It. I have to. Pretty soon. You know what? I want um I want BJ's perspective. I want the man's perspective on anxiety because I know you've had nervousness and mm -hmm. things like that. And I still I think do. That, I have. Even... I think that men just like suffer in silence. Mm. So let's give let's give a platform to the dudes right now. No beach. more silence. <laughs> no more. Si well, I think Lift that's. The veil, I think that's what men do is they internalize it and that fear mm. inside. And this is what I'm starting to see at these races as I go. As I do more and more Ironman races, I'm, I'm participating more. So I'm at these briefings. I'm at these, uh, the village, like, sign up, and I'm not the person who's like anxious about, oh my God, like I'm six people back. It's going to take me longer. And then I'm going to have to go get my food and it's going to delay. Like, I don't think about that anymore. What I do is observe. So I'm calm in all this chaos. And I see, I see the guys wanting to chatter. The, the default, I believe, is they start to talk and they start to joke around and then, they, they get into one story about the, the water temperature and then the next person jumps in about the water temperature and then the next person and then all this energy is building up. Now everybody's on board and I'm sitting there just calm and I can see all this happening. And what initially clicks in my mind is all this energy that you're going to need on race day to achieve a, an event that's so enormous. If you took all that energy that you're using outwards, right? All this anxious energy, whatever it is, and just... Just reel it back in. And you say how, right? We want to tell people how. Like, right. how do you do that? Oh, and, and still honor maybe your natural extrovert. 
or whatever it is. Right. Like, can you participate in these conversations without giving too much of your energy away? Well, that's where, and you can describe it. Cool. That's, yeah, where being the, selective. that's where what we call you put on the white light pantsuit. Yeah. So in, so meditation, <laughs> that's how, so meditation every morning I'm putting white light over myself, starting with my feet and I go all the way up my body and I push everything out like a squeegee, right? Uh-huh. And it goes all the way out and all that junk that goes up is all like self doubt and, and I'm just like scraping it out. Right. And that leaves a, that leaves a gap. Like there's some space there. So then I just pour in unwavering faith and belief. I, I pour in speed, I pour in strength, compassion, like all these words just start flooding in. And now all that space is filled. And as time goes on, that that hole gets a little shallower and a little shallower because I'm clear I'm doing the work to clear all this out. Uh-huh. So then as I go to these races, I put on that white light pantsuit. When I go to the swim, and I since I've been doing this, <laughs> I it's go in the onesie. swim. It's just a onesie. It's a onesie. You zip it right up. Yeah, yeah perfect. And, and it's got that big neck, so you zip it up like oh, up yeah, here. Like so it's like a mock turtle, like a super high collar. Yeah. 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 Super. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get on these swims, and I'm swimming the inside lane. Like, I'm going to hit people, and I don't get, I don't get, I got this white light on, and I don't see people. A person comes up, and I'm siding, and I see that person, so I move over to the left. And there's somebody over there, I move over to the right. And as long as I'm siding, and I've got this white light suit, I don't have any contact with anybody. This but, is amazing. <laughs> but I think for guys, and I'm going to generalize here because I felt this. It was like a struggle. Like I have to get in there and I have to clobber people. And I've got, I, I'm, I was wronged out there. Like somebody hit me and my glasses came off and they wronged me. And so, so this is my story. I didn't get my swim because my goggles came off and that guy hit me twice. And then somebody kicked me and right. it's all externalizing when in reality, if you just take it back in and be like, okay, well, he was he was there to teach me a lesson. Like maybe I need to sight a little bit more and see who's in front of me. Uh-huh. Right. And that is so hard to do. That's the battle with the ego, right? The ego wants to be like pat it on the back, like boost it up. Yeah. Like, and point at other people. Absolutely. And there are other, and the other issues that are not your issues. Right. Yeah. But if you go back to that mirror, right, you go back uh-huh. to the mirror, especially for guys, they're looking outside. I mean, you go there and you're seeing all these fit guys and they're jacked up and you go on Instagram and social media and you see all this stuff and that can take you so far the other way. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. But just come back. Just that's, This is where the meditation work happens. Yeah, it's, and it's just the breath, Nicole. It's just like a one conscious breath that starts right there. It's not... I'm yes. taking it right now. I'm back. <laughs> and we're back. Everybody wants that. <laughs> I need to go moment. 15 minutes, right? This yeah, is like a training. Yeah, yeah. I want to run a 10K in sub 40 minutes. All right. And so they go out and run a 10K as fast as they can. First day of training. It's like, w- that's, not, that's not how, that's you, not get how you get there. <laughs> yeah. So can you apply that to everything in your life? Yeah, the food absolutely. you eat, totally. the relationships with your significant others, your children. Well, and this, we've been seeing this a lot lately, uh, like with athletes, like we, they see where they are now and they see where they want to go. But what we don't, it's, it's the stuff in the middle. That's what we call the work, right? And it's when things get tough. It's, it's it's that's when most people abandon their practice in self-development is when things get tough. Okay. I actually want to talk about what you had mentioned about expectation too. Yeah. So, because this is like what first you have to reframe what you think your goal is or whatever, or maybe find different levels or dimensions of goals. Cause like winning a race doesn't necessarily make you happier as a person. You know, Tim's Ironman, the, he, Tim won Hawaii twice. His, his, they're now, his they're now trophies, change collectors. <laughs> he's, they are. And they were in boxes for years when we got here. I finally said, can I just please put them in the office? Because I'm going to put my Ironman thing out there. So I, I don't want to be the only one. So we put him out. But he will be the first one to tell you that winning that race did not make him happier. It may have eventually had the opposite effect. That... There needs to be something more about the quest than just winning. Well, we always say it's about the journey, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. Um, So when you won Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. what was that experience like? So you're Ironman champion. Like you, what, let's back it up. What did it take for you to win? Where did you have to go to win? That's a great question. Um, I've got a few good insights now looking back. But this was 2004. It's been 14 years. 
<laughs> it's not overnight, people. There is no pill. <laughs> no, there's, there's no, no hack. Pill. Screw there's the hack. No well, I'd like to know, like, so just on that, like, mm-hmm. now... Yeah. How you reflect on it, but also in the moment, like what were your thoughts then, if you can call it, but go ahead with your Yeah. Well, in the moment, you know, I was just on my journey as a professional triathlete, but I had already reached this sort of internal tipping point where I knew that triathlon would not be the end all be all for me. I saw what it took for Tim to win Hawaii. It was sacrifice at the highest level, singular focus at the highest level, marriage barely making it, right? You don't have time for anything when you're going after a world championship, right? And I knew that for this sport, I was not willing to give that. And I also knew that for me to feel a little more complete or satisfied or fulfilled or whatever the word is, I needed people around me. I am like the epitome of an extrovert. I, if no one's around, my energy will dwindle till it's gone. Like I thrive on being around other people and having great conversations, having physical experiences, whatever. So I had already stumbled upon this idea for what later became skirt sports. And I was working on this idea to make the first ever running skirt. And so prior and leading up to Ironman, I was already being fueled by something else. And I did not decide to do that race until three months before the race. I was like, I think, Tim, I think I'm going to go do that Ironman in Wisconsin. It's been around for a couple years now. And it was like June, right? (laughs) What made you, what made, like, was it just kind of like you had this hit? Like, i am got to do this or? I think I was on like a bit of a buzz, like all over. My brain was buzzing in a way it hadn't in many years because I was learning and I was learning about how do you start a clothing company? I mean, and there's so many components to that. So I'm every day learning new things and my mind is being blown and I'm having conversations and making, you know, Barry Siff's wife made my first prototype of the skirt. Not kidding. Because we all know Jody can make anything. She is. She's amazing. And um, she gave it to me and I was like, I think I'm going to wear this in that, in the Ironman I'm going to do. So I entered that race with like a secret power, like a little magic secret weapon. And it was that there's more to life than just the race. Um, so in that race itself, there's detachment in that so big. We hear that all the time. Like once I just let it go and said, I'm just going to go out there and have fun and see how fast I can go. That's when they qualify for Kona. That's when they win the race. That's when they win their age group. You know, it's often when people quit everything else and just focus on one thing that they never get faster. Yeah. I mean, this happens so much because I think it's attachment. Attachment is so heavy. Yes. And it, it, and when we put that pressure on ourselves, right. And we feel that pressure and that's, that pressure does not feel loving. And that pressure brings us exactly what we don't want. Totally. And like, who's putting the pressure on us? You just said it. Right. Ourselves. Us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, so yeah, no one else cares. You know, it's funny when you like do your race recap, it better be someone you love because no one really wants to hear the whole play by play. (laughs) Really? They just want to know, do you feel good? Are you happy? Right. And you're like, yeah, let's go get a burger in the old, in my old life, you know, right. let's go get a, <laughs> a no plant evil. filled, <laughs> you know, whole grain falafel now. But like, so you went into that race with superpowers. I went into it with Love superpowers it. and I didn't really know it at the time, but I was riding on a little different high. That's I still cool. had other issues and things going on. And I, uh, I recounted a story recently that, um, it's always been there, but I kind of forgot about it or I didn't realized that maybe it was important. Um, until recently when I was thinking about this, my own purpose or where I feel my purpose is now. And it's that when I, so the race was great, right? I came out of the water first. Someone told me, we'll have to look this up, that I might still have the swim record because they changed the swim course and it got like harder. <laughs> it's like one big loop. It's now. one big That's loop all. now. It was too loop forever. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I don't, but someone told me I did. Um, and it was mass start. It was a mass start. Oh, the mass start was so fun. It was fun. So I don't know. I haven't done, I don't know what, what's out there now. It's been a while. But, um, and I came off the bike in third place. And when I got to that transition, I got all my stuff on and I looked at that little skirt and I decided I'm doing it. I'm going to wear a swimsuit with a skirt. And I ran out on the run course and, you know, I ticked off the people ahead of me. 
Um, I can't remember who was second, but Andrea Fisher was leading. And I have a lot of respect for her too. She's, she's an incredible person, but we, you know, I, I finally was leading by maybe mile 15, 16. And I was not, I was never the best runner. Like, I don't think I ever ran faster than a 3:30 marathon in an Ironman. I was never the best runner. I always ran scared. And there it was no different here. Like I passed them, but there were other people coming. And it got hot and you know everything out there and you know we often even revert to the immediate gratification things like dumping the water on your head, which is awesome and feels great until it goes straight into your shoes. And then you're like squishing and squeaking around and getting your blisters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I even think back on that and I'm like, it never hit my shoes. It hit the skirt. It rolled through the fabric and it swished on my thighs. Like it kept me cool. I mean, looking back, it Flow, really baby. was a yeah. magical day. So I win the race and it was incredible, right? But here's the story that I realized might be important now. There was no one for me at the finish. I was all alone there. Yeah, Mike Riley was there. Hey, Mike. Yeah, I won an Ironman. You know, but um, Tim didn't come because he was training for Hawaii. And our life hinged around the importance of his career because he earned a lot more money. And Hawaii's a little bigger of a win than an Ironman, a different Ironman. And, you know, I, I didn't have any family there, just friends that I saw. And, um, when we walked into the trans, uh, drug testing afterwards, my body, it was a physical reaction. It may, it just might've been everything coming together. I just started crying, like sobbing and I could barely talk. And it just was this constant cry for about an hour. And I sat in there kind of shaking and crying all alone with the other people who were in the drug testing area who had their person with them, their dedicated person, their spouse, whatever. And now I look back on that and I think it was like really symbolic to me that like, I didn't wanna be alone. And my next thing needed to be something that included other people and allowed me to spread the positive energy I have and funnel it and, and, you know, cr help create it through other people and bring it back around. I love that story so much. It was like, it was this, all this stuff was happening, right? So this is how the universe works, right? We, we're not, so there's our plan, right? We've got this calendar of all these things we're going to do and goals and like, and they have like stars on that day on the calendar. But then there's this other plan. We call it uh, the divine <laughs> schedule maker, right? I like that. Oh uh, yeah. It's the divine <laughs> schedule maker. Rarely, does rarely <laughs> does that, yeah. Does, does that schedule match up to mine? Although it's matching up to mine more and more now that I'm just like, I've just given it up and I've said, you know what, just lead the way and I will follow. But again, that's years and years and years of building that intuitive voice through meditation and mindfulness. But I love it because it, this whole thing was like skirt sports is in its like it's still an embryo yes. and you're like wearing the skirt and it was that that split second decision like I'm gonna put this on and then you cross the finish line you win what a way to go out then you mourn like just totally. grief probably like just mourning Shedding. I think the lot like so your subconscious mourning the loss yeah. of that of that role as an athlete and yes. then you're having this realization of like I don't want to be alone and there's, and like, you already knew there was something more. Totally. It's just so cool. It was like a rebirth. It really was. And I will say that the hardest years in our marriage, we've had a few cycles of hard years, right? That around that time, the next couple of years were really hard because I was ready to create a new identity, right? Most people don't know me as like a pro triathlete from back in the day, or they'll go, oh yeah, you won like five Ironmans, right? Like the Hawaii one. And I'll just be like, yeah, sure. So, um, what do you, what kind of coffee do you want? <laughs> like, it's not even worth explaining. Right. But they know me as the skirt lady and the founder of skirt sports and someone who does something else in the world. But back then during that transition, I was grappling with it, but Tim was still in that world and he was still in the singular focus world. And while his, his results were shooting down the backside, which is brutal to watch someone you love, not sure if they might win another race or not, 
right? Oh, Until, and then there's like, there's doubt, right? So there's got to oh, be secret doubt that's coming in. Totally. Oh. And then clinging to that, yes. where you've been, where yes. you've been. Yes. And, you know, and as a partner to that, you're thinking about your marriage and you're in the middle space. Like you said, the space where you need to do the work, but you both need to actually do the work too. You Not both just need to do yeah. the work. And um, <laughs> man, it's just, it's a hard space. I honestly feel like Tim and I have had a few marriages as different identities each time, you know, and maybe we'll have more, but every time the hard stuff happens during big life events, our other really hard time in our marriage was about a year after Wilder was born, like just a few years ago. She's six now. And it, it, that's, it makes sense because we're being cracked open a little bit and being asked to change. And then we have to adjust to each other and figure out who we want to be. But that's the contrast, right? Like that's, it's amazing. that's the contrast in life. And those are the opportunities that earlier on in the podcast, I said, like, those are the, oppor- those are the moments where so many people will abandon and say, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't, like I can't. And they'll, and because those, those old patterns are still there, we can recoil. So in any given moment, we're expanding or contracting. There's no stasis in moving this life. Moving forward and moving backwards. Mm-hmm. We're either move forward, right? right? And so a lot of times when it gets tough, we constrict and we pull into those old patterns mm-hmm. when we have the biggest opportunity to create these new neural pathways to say, you know, I am going to take that step and it's like, I might fall and it's going to feel awful, but I'm just going to take this breath and I'm going to take this next logical step and you, and you get to the other side, like, you guys have gotten to the other side and you're going to cycle times. through, right? <laughs> yeah. But and this you is, too. Oh my God, totally. Like we are not. Still now. I had. Yeah. Still to this mm-hmm. day. I had a meditation on the plane yesterday, which was one of the most intense meditations I have had in years. Are people looking at you? Are you like, do you have the hands um, on I, the, At this point, I can, I can care yeah. less. And the, totally. It doesn't, doesn't matter. And this, both of us are doing it. With our hoods over. Yo, oh, oh, oh my God. I look like a, you look I like just, you're in a gang. I look like a, a, the Unabomber. <laughs> a little scary. I really did. Okay. That's very scary on an airplane. <laughs> like I put my hood on. You I got my not, headphones. Okay. You guys, she could never look like the Unabomber. <laughs> okay. Listen. But we have our, we call them our meditation heads. Like I'm like, I'm just like, you're putting your meditation hood on. I'm like, yeah. Is it an actual meditation hood? It's just my hoodie. brand. It's just we, oh should make, we could make that though. I mean, that could be And a then product. I put it on and I put my headphones in and I set my meditation timer. I did a 90 minute meditation on the plane yesterday. And, um, okay, wait, I started headspace. I'm doing the three minute. I started it. I started with five minutes. Okay. 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 So right. 90 minutes is so I'm and still behind. By the way, point, I but. didn't want to do 90 minutes. I wanted to do it because planes to me are like, that's when you, well, it's a great place to do meditation. And I love doing long meditation and I didn't want to do 90 minutes. And there was that I was in the hub and the hub was saying, you go 90 <laughs> minutes, girl, there's something here for you. So I went 90 minutes and I had the most intense meditation. It was this energy that was coming up. It was like, I felt like there was a blood, like I felt like my skin was the outside of a blood pressure cuff and it was just pump, pump, pump. And I felt like I was going to throw up. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was moving something really, really nasty. And it took 90 minutes for that to happen. I mean, I was like sweating. I was cold. I, I mean, I don't know what I looked like. I don't even care anymore. What'd you move? Do you know? It was, I don't know, it was something really gooey and nasty. And uh, I think it was, it was actually started with this visualization of this forgiveness meditation that I've done. And it's um, basically in that meditation, you meet up with somebody. And I actually met up with myself. And I was kind of like, oh, that's weird. Like, I don't really have anything to forgive. And then I just said, I said to myself, I'm perfect. Yeah. Say, (laughs) says the person who needs to forgive. And I just said to myself, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the years that I, I beat up our, our body and I suffered with food and I suffered with judgment of other people and myself. And, and I just said that, and it wasn't like emotional or anything. I just said, I'm so, I'm sorry, but I'm so happy that I was you because now I'm who I am. Mm. And I think that that sets something, some kind of deep root. Oh loose. yeah. But like, that's the contrast that I'm talking about. That's the contrast that whatever it was that I moved yesterday on that plane is, is gone now. Like I up leveled myself. That's the contrast. I've been meditating for, you know, eight, nine years now. 
and they have not been all beautiful. It was a street fight for a year. I mean, I did not, I was the girl that couldn't sit down. I was, mm-hmm. I had a lot of energy, yeah, right? Totally. Like I've got a lot of energy. You do. But I needed the contrast. <laughs> I needed the contrast. You did. And it's exactly what I, I needed. The stillness. Maturity helps too, to realize that. Oh yeah. And being 46 yeah, is helpful. And, you know, embracing who we are and wait, when's your birthday again? Oh, we're at, you're are we both co- February? No, I'm March 4th. Oh yeah. You're we're Aquarius. Like, yeah. You're yeah, Pisces. Girl. Pisces. Okay. So I feel like you were going to say something. Yeah. Do what you were remember? you remember? I know. I felt him like he was like going in, but I was like, no, oh, I, the selective. I've got the mic. So the way that you, <laughs> the way, the 90 minutes, this is so cool. The night, because we just talked about this with our last mm-hmm. podcast, but, but the 90 minute meditation, right? You have that, you have that tendency to, to back away from it because you're used to the 45 minutes or an hour, whatever it is. So why are you selectively using the tools that you've used in triathlon or gritting it out, getting a project done? Why are you selectively using what's already inside you on specific things? So it shows that you have that choice. You have the choice. You have the choice. Jess has the choice. And she acted on it and did 90 minutes you have the choice to sit with headspace for 10 minutes so you Dude. you have the but <laughs> but it's inside you like you've trained you've won an iron man like you have the will right. and this right. is why athletes are so great you have the will so why would you selectively choose that will for things that now you've already accomplished because your mind's going back and saying oh i've already done that so now i can go run whatever you need to run or swim comes easy to you like wow. i can go swim laps why can't you take that and this is goes for anybody and apply it to anything and, and if it's something that scares you or you're fearful of oh man jump in and get after that okay why can't you just get rid of all your shit and minimalize your life and go do it in your early 40s why can't you you can you can you can everything's a choice we're living we're living proof so was like let's talk about your journey then for a minute with this because i think this the fact that you guys picked up and made such a massive life change halfway through your life, or maybe hopefully not halfway through. It was so big. Like, how do you even come to that decision? And how do you both get on the same page? Like, I can imagine one of you being like, you know, maybe we should do the minimalist thing. And the other person going, yeah, that sounds great. Let's meditate on it. You know, like, uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty much, much what happened. Shut up. I yeah. saw an ad for a tiny house. I think when we were here when, in Boulder. When we were here in Boulder and... BJ was doing his web thing and I was doing, I was doing marketing for Boulder College Massage Therapist th- Therapy and I had my massage practice and BJ was like, come in here. So I went into his office. He's like, check this out. And it was this tiny house. And at the time I was like, no, we're not having kids. And I was like, that's awesome. And I think that, that was the seed. That was the day that the seed was planted. Now, when do you think that was BJ? Like 2009? Or 2008? No, probably like 2007 or... It was probably a long seven, time ago. It was ago. before tiny homes were like yeah, a thing. I yeah, think what people yeah. see is they see this, the six months where we got rid of everything. What they don't see is the nine and a half years before that where we made the commitment and said, stop acquiring. So was it like this? Did you feel something shift in you when you looked at each other and you're like, we could do that? We want that. We want and that. And mid-30s, this yeah. was happening? Mm-hmm. Yep. And you're fully entrenched in careers. And so you didn't know what it all meant yet. And we had just got like, we, you know, we bought a little town home in Boulder and then we bought a house and, you know, I bought like grown up furniture, went down to concepts. Is that concepts furniture? Yeah, there's so We have some concepts. I love furniture. concepts <laughs> furniture and pottery barn and like got all this stuff and artwork and everything and I was still in all of that I loved minute. all of that I just realized as you walk through our house it might look pretty absurd with all the Legos the dolls the play stuff the things you don't judge though that's the beauty of no it. no I used to everybody really their, oh, oh yeah yeah oh <laughs> <laughs> You both did? Oh or? my God, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it's just... Especially stepping away from the mic. It's, well, yeah. I mean, would you have thrown away all the awards? Like, why All you, our medals are why gone. Why keep them? All why keep them? Why? They were in a... We moved from Bola to Newport and we kept... They were in boxes the whole time. So we could just put Tim's Iron Man stuff on the curb. He wouldn't Does that mean care. he doesn't win them? Does no. It, no, he has that memory. Like, exactly. Right. And it really costs races money to give these things. Yeah. What's the big deal? I so know. we don't... I go to these races now. I don't take anything. And if there's somebody that wants wants it wow. like there I'll give him my bag I'll give him my medal at the end and the hat and people are really excited because they find value in it right I don't have that and it's okay it's it doesn't totally mean that it's fine right we're better or we're like 
It doesn't mean that we're better or we're right for the things that we do, but we're in alignment with who we are. And I know without a doubt that BJ and I are on this earth to assist others in living in alignment with who they truly are, whatever that looks like, whatever, if they're like a, a, you know, extra long SUV meat eater, you know, gun collector, let's get, let, and if that's truly in their alignment, all right, well then that's in their alignment, right? We're not, we don't judge them because of what they do or the choices they make. It's about getting, it's a, it's like, it's like core work, right? It's like yoga. It's like strengthen from the inside out. Yeah. Let's go in. Yeah. Let's see what can you is feel, aligned. Can you feel driving that big truck? Can you feel it? Or are you just like driving on the road? Like, can you really feel like, feel the wheel? Feel how long it is? Feel, yeah. feel like how much space you're taking up on the road and just enjoy it. Can you really soak that up? That's, mm-hmm. that's the essence of this all. Well, and it seems like too, like you saw, there was a visual thing that triggered you. Tiny house. But what's this really all about? Like living in a tiny home. Great. But what did this really become about for you two? This shift, this change in your life? I, for, for me, I, looking back, right? Like looking back is, is so fun. This is your Iron Man Wisconsin yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my Iron Man Wisconsin moment. Looking back now, I see a drive for simplicity and like a debt-free life as, a, as, a, as an easier life as a freeing life. When is, I, is easier important? Well, I think at the time when I was avoiding meditation, I was avoiding seeing what was brewing under the surface. I was looking, right, which most of us do. I was looking outside of myself. Okay, well, what if we just, li- that looks like a really simple life. That looks like freedom to me. Mm. But what I've realized is that I said at the beginning, you can get rid of everything you own, but you can't get rid of yourself. So it wasn't until I started to do the real work inside that I realized that that's freedom, you know, and because we've risked it all and because we've put everything into Yogi Trathley and um, furthering this mission and this amazing, beautiful community that has developed across the globe, we've got debt. We actually have more debt than we we have ever had. But my relationship to that has shifted so much. And I see like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for that debt because that has allowed me to further walk this path that I am so aligned with. And I am, I have been brought to my knees by the universe and I see that every time that contrast comes in so sharp, I know that on the other side of it, it is an equal size to the growth if I can just stick with it and do the work in a moment. So I think at first for me, the minimalistic stuff felt like, oh, that's my answer to not feeling so anxious or like have so many things to do. It was an actionable approach. Right. What I didn't realize is, yeah, what I didn't realize is that it was what I see now is, and I want BJ to answer this too, from your perspective, Beach. But what I see now is that minimizing my material life to such an extreme allowed the space for me to do incredible, expansive work on myself that now I am working with incredible athletes and non-athletes to assist them in doing the same thing because they're ready. Right. And now I see yeah. that the min- can, that mm-hmm. the minimal, because I don't have like all this stuff like, oh, we have to do, I, I mean, it takes a half an hour for me. That's a deep clean on our 400 square foot studio where we live, like a half an hour. Whereas before it was two and a half hours. Now I can take that two hours and I can do an hour with a medita- with a mindfulness client and I can do an hour meditation myself, right? Like I got time back right. to, to do some really, really deep, expansive stuff so that I can further live my purpose and also become a deliberate creator in my life and become that architect and manifest like a master. I love it. So PJ, what, what was it for you? I like this question. What was it for you, like the minimalism at first and what does it become? Yeah, it was definitely 
it was definitely physical at first. It was like you remove all this stuff, uh. the stuff, actual stuff. And we, I think the biggest thing that I had to let go was my treadmill. Like to let go of my treadmill. I was so attached to oh, my yeah. treadmill. Like really attached. When I saw it go down the road, I was I was a little sad. You mourned. You had your sobbing I moment. Had my <laughs> sobbing moment. Because I've had awesome workouts on there. Like in the basement, like running between the beams because it doesn't fit in the basement. So I had to run and put padding up on the beams yeah, up top. He had to cut out a piece of the insulation. Yeah. Well, and look, you kind of are nostalgic for it. Yes. Still a little yeah, bit. I am. But you've let it go. I've let it go. It's just a feeling. Yeah, it's just yeah. a feeling. And I still have that. So yeah. I don't really need the treadmill to do that. Right. And then it came down to t-shirts, like t-shirts oh. for me to come down to like five t-shirts. It was like the last day we were still donating shirts. I went from, I, I mean, I still had like 10 t-shirts to finish. What if I had to give up all my skirt sports? I have tubs, <laughs> tubs, because it's part of like something that's been important to me. It's a part of your identity. Ah, you know, I got rid of my I got rid of all my try stuff. But see, it's Someday, steps. Yeah, it's it's steps. steps. It's one thing. So when they when we look at our stuff, yeah. you look around, yeah. I'm like, I don't need two bikes. Oh, I can get really smart. I can buy like a Wahoo kicker and now I don't need two sets of wheels. I can just use just put it onto the Amazing. cassette. Like you just think yeah. of things like that. And people ask, like, oh, let's go for a road ride. We use a road I don't have a road bike, so that's not an option. I can go for a tri, tri bike ride or not. It, it just minimizes the stress. Yeah. That's, this is what it's come to, is like decision fatigue. Mm. So I don't worry about which sneakers I'm going to wear. I have one pair of sneakers. You're looking at them. I've been oh. one pair of sneakers a year. The Hoka's. Oh. They're at the front door. They're at the front door. <laughs> I have one pair of Ufos. Like, yeah. I don't have any decision fatigue. I have two pairs of shorts. Decision fatigue. That is where your mind just keeps like, oh, should I do this? Or should I, do that? Should I wear that? And you look at your closet. And there's things I have not worn in a year. And they're still in there. So... Why? You, such a good point. And this whole decision fatigue, this happens on so many levels for people to the point where you paralyze, get paralyzed, but then also you start to doubt yourself and your ability to make decisions. So you start asking everyone around you what their decision would be for your decision. Looking outside of yourself for I, the it's answers. It's ridiculous. I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I am you, absolutely so Im like impressed by your journey. Like I knew you guys, we weren't like the tightest, like we didn't sleep over at each other's houses, you know, no. but like I knew you guys and you're the same people, but there is such a different energy around you. And I totally understand how and why you have built such a, an amazing community. You are doing something really different out there. We are doing something really, no, you know, n nobody's doing like, I know. I mean, I, and I mean this in the in an ego, egotistical way. I think that mindfulness is really blowing up, but we were the ones. Just like you were the one. That's. I mean, anytime anybody talks about skirts, yeah. I always say my friend Nicole de Boom started that revolution. It's true. Like we were the ones that were we were doing this years and years and years ago, and nobody. I mean, people would run in the opposite direction. It's like crickets. Yeah, they didn't quite get it. No, and now they're mm -hmm. coming in because they know that they. You know, they can do Iron Man after Iron Man after Iron Man. They can do Ultraman. They can do all these things, but it's, they're still not finding what it is that they're craving. Yeah. And what they're finding when they come to us is they're like, oh my God, what I'm craving is already inside of me. So how about that? You mentioned ego. I, I swim coached before I was a pro triathlete, little kids and stuff. And I one day realized like, you claim to be in a selfless profession when you're like a teacher and a coach, but I got so much gratitude and like, uh, not gratitude so much as like, well, yeah, they were grateful for me, but my ego was stroked by my swimmers swimming fast. And I realized that it's like a selfish, selfless <laughs> pursuit. Yes, you're lit it, up. Yeah. And so I don't know. I just thought it was a really interesting thing because you you have like a fine line between coaching and guiding athletes, but letting, not letting your ego try to take credit for their performances or their happiness or their personal growth. So right? I think there's a really fine line here, right? Because... We've got two things. We've got the ego that the, and the ego coach is the ego coach. That's like, 
you know, really uh, letting it stroke them and pat them on, on the back so that they're, it's not so much of like them being in service of others. And also the ego coach is the coach that gets paranoid when there's like another coach or maybe one of their athletes says, oh, I was talking to this coach. The ego coach is the one that starts to get really paranoid and scared about that. Then, but then there's this other thing about unworthiness. Like, why can't we get excited when our, when our team, like one of our um, athletes won a race? Why can't we celebrate that? Yeah, we were a part of that. So I think part of it is like this unworthiness of like, we feel then like, oh, if, if we feel good about that, that that's bad. And so it's really getting to the essence of, and watching yourself move through the world, right? Watching when you get that like kind of paranoid, like, you know, I mean, you must, I, okay. the, when other companies started making skirts mm. and here you are, like you started <laughs> yeah. your business out of the basement I and now so you've mad. got Athleta, you've Everyone. got Lulu, people Any, with big, yeah. huge bank accounts mm-hmm. and board of directors. Yeah. How did that feel? Well, it's a good, you make a good point because I started something that had never been done. So I was sort of like a, what is there even left to create in women's fitness apparel, right? But somehow I took something people were using for other sports and recreated it for a whole new uh, a whole new group of people. And what it did was shift the way they thought about the female athlete. Like you could look cute when you work out, right? Yes. Totally. Skirt sports changed... Skirt sports had a huge effect in my transformation in believing in myself and believing that I was worthy and beautiful the way that I was. Oh so my you know. gosh. I'm going to send you home with some stuff from my bins <laughs> basement. <laughs> Wait, you can't take it. You're minimalist. <laughs> right. Just Shoot. Do it. <laughs> throw something else away and I'm going to give you something. That's exactly what happens. Um, one out, one in. But you're, you know, and that's, that's what I think. So here's the deal. Other people pick... You are going to get copied if you're onto something good. It's just how it is. And you can either own an entire category that's like a million dollar category and be the only player in it, or you could be a 10% player in a billion dollar category. And when you think about it like that, it's like you can't stop other people from trying to be smart, trying to move their business forward in a positive way. All you can do is keep moving forward with your own pure intentions. And my intention which is really interesting, shifted a little bit. It started as I wanted to look cute, right? And create something functional that fit women. But then it became so much more. It became about lifting and empowering women and not making them compromise a part of themselves when they were out there working out. So as soon as I finally cut the crap and said, I'm not a clothing company, I'm a company that lifts and empowers women, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe we'll go out of business. Maybe we won't. Well, we're still here 14 years later because we've also created this incredible community of women who come together. The product, it's a byproduct of what we do. And the inspiration, the connection is what like the heart of skirt sports is, right? So it is, it's an interesting concept about growth and then letting go to grow more. This is mm-hmm. so interesting. And it sounds so much like your journey too. And there's so many parallels. We're in different worlds, but we're not. We're connected in so many ways. But man, and you talk about how does the ego feel when other people are copying you? Like you guys are probably also experiencing. Yeah. I mean, some of the students that I, some of my meditation students are now teaching meditation. Amazing. What, what is the mission of Yogi Triathlete? We're on a mission to create a better world. Well, hmm, I kind of think that's going to create a better world. Absolutely. Right? And some of our athletes are coaching other athletes. Now, we could get all clamped up about that, but instead we say, how can we help you? How can... Because these people, yeah. they're in the buy-in. They come to Yogi Triathlete because not only do they want to kick ass on the course, they want to kick ass in life. And so... Now they want to share that with their athletes, you know, because this, I, we are shifting the paradigm of training. It is not physical. Physical is the, if anybody can get the physical, it's the mental, it's the true mental training that is the missing piece. And I'm talking about creating new neural pathways. I'm talking about lifting out deep Mm -hmm. roots of unworthiness and, um, and, you know, negativity and doubt and all of that. 
I mean, we are changing the face of athleticism, hands down, no question. And so we always go back to our mission. We always go back to our mission and our tag, right? So our tag is awake and ready. Like we want to be awake and ready, all channels open. I know we're both wearing it right now. Like all channels open and that's what you did with skirt sports. And so this is what I want to stress to people, like all channels open. If anybody ever told me 12 years ago when I was wearing my skirt sports special edition, I love running t-shirt on every one of my runs because I hated <laughs> running that I was now going to be an were, ultra runner. Oh my God. All channels open, yeah. right? Never love say it. never. And that's what you did with skirt sports. You said we're not just a clothing company. We're a company that does this. Like we're not right. just, we're not just, we don't just train athletes. You know, we, we have, we put a recipe together of what transformed our lives and allows us to live on this high, high level. Like mm -hmm. when you talk about the energy that's around us, let me tell you, we're living in that energy. I know how high and big and expansive it feels. It's amazing compared to how I felt 10, 15, 20 years ago when I was still in that inner struggle. Can I? Okay, we have to do a time check first. I know. Where are we at? We're at an hour 10. It's 11, 13 a.m. Mountain Great. time. Oh, yeah. I have to go soon. But we have a little... We got... Ten, do you have 10 more minutes? Your, yeah. your interviews run long. No, we're... You guys are good. <laughs> they, Mine do, too. We're usually about an... We an always hour. say an hour, but it's always like an um, hour. Just a Mine's over. supposed yeah. to be 36 minutes. <laughs> what? <laughs> so the average 5K, average American 5K. Oh, nice. Um, but I it like never that. is. Everybody laughs. They're like, at least a 10K this time. So I want to <laughs> ask, because, you know, you, we're talking about... And this is two podcasts at once. Right. So, so it's like double. <clears throat> You're right on the mark. Double the love. Um, the kid thing. We talked about it on my end. We didn't really talk about it on your end. And a lot of what we're talking about is how I just keep thinking about how some of the things you're saying and your philosophies and even some of the things I'm doing can help teach children and help parents be better parents and um, help create little beings that have a good sense of self, you know, or can make good decisions and figure out their values and all that. But I actually want to ask you why you didn't have kids because everything about you two is so nurturing and loving. And like, I know it's a personal and weird question and people ask it all the time. Like people ask me, why don't you drink? Like, why do you think? Like, there's only a few good answers usually, right? And on my end, it's not the most positive answer. So like, People are just curious and they see people like you and they want to know, why didn't you have kids? Well, I can <clears throat> take my, per I can share my perspective and then I want BJ to share his perspective because BJ was the guy that was never going to get married too. Yeah. So, I had hard lines. I, my all channels were locked down. Yeah. There was, there was no, no all channel. There was like <laughs> one channel. And, um, so for me, you know, I, I've always been really intuitive as a child, I was so, I'm so intuitive, and that's kind of a sign of a Pisces. I'm also a very, very old soul. I have a lot of um, intuitive sense, and I've acted on it my whole life. And intuitively, even as a kid growing up, I never wanted to have children. And people would ask me to babysit, and I'd be like, why are they asking me to babysit? Like, I'm the worst babysitter, you know? But... I don't know. They would ask me to babysit. And then I got into my 20s and I got into my 30s. And then you get into your 30s and now we're married. And we've always been a super solid couple. You know, we've had we've had ups and downs and growth spurts and contrast and all that stuff. But, you know, the moment that I saw BJ and I only saw the back of him, it was the moment that I saw him. And I know now that it was the moment that our souls came back together in this life to do work. Wait, you saw his ass. <laughs> yeah. And, and I fell got. in love with him. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him from the back and, and you see him and, from and the front. Souls, mm -hmm. It was the moment that our souls can reconnected and was Your like, energy. it's on. It, it was there. Like it's on. And that's we, a real thing. And we grew, we met when we were 25 and we grew up together and, and, um, you know, we've gone through a lot, but when I got into my thirties and I'm in this solid relationship, it's amazing what people will say to you. I, I can't, I mean, you will never find joy in your life. You will miss mm. your purpose. You will never be happy. Why are you wasting your life? These are things, and I, so these we are, got it too. Because these are str mm -hmm. whatever strangers, um, yeah, that's acquaintances, 
and neighbors. family <laughs> yeah. and family. Family's the one that's the like hardest. right down to my mother. Why are why you are missing the best thing in your life? And I would always say like I'm not. I, I it's not. I'm not feeling it. So then I would ask my non-judgmental friends, and I remember my friend Meredith said to me, "Listen, if you wanted kids, you would know." And so when I, what a lot of people mm-hmm. don't know is that when I was 36, we started trying to have kids and we said, let's give it two years. And I did everything. I did acupuncture. You know, I was somebody who could always make things happen, but I was using like a lot of like my will, like this is going to happen. Had you already moved into the mindfulness and meditation side I, it, of tapped was, into that side it of was yourself? Cu- it was there. Mm-hmm. It was like through massage school, there was a lot of like, we had meditation and massage school mm-hmm. and embodiment and present moment awareness. And so this whole world was opening for me. And, you know, all holistic medicine. And so I did acupuncture and I charted my temperature and, you know, we'd be like, okay, we need to have sex now. And, and, um, and we tried, which was awesome, but annoying. Yeah, I know. I'd be like, let's go (laughs) right now. (laughs) I know. And, um, and it would be exciting and I would stay positive. I would stay positive. And everywhere I looked, a woman was pregnant and I'd be like, it's a sign it's happening. It's happening. And then every month would be the contrast would Mm -hmm. be the sobbing. Why isn't this happening? What, you know, it was so, it was so beautiful because now I'm like, Oh, what a great healing experience that I put myself into for two years, detachment, you know? And, um, and then it got to a point where it was like, like literally I looked at the calendar and I was like, Okay, it's been two years. Back on the pill. Whew, dodge that bullet. Wow. Like, I don't think either of us were, as much as I was in it, I think I was in it in my competitive athlete, like, I'm going to make this happen. And we never told anybody. Well, what's interesting is you could have just stayed off the pill and been like, all right, it's been two years. I haven't gotten pregnant now, so yeah, probably I won't. was like, no way. I want to get back to racing. Got so, um, and I think, was that my first? No, my first Ironman was at 36. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I signed up for another Ironman. And and um, so now I'm 46. And I would say maybe like two years ago, my mom called me and said to me, you know what? I know why you never had children. Because I see the work that you and BJ are doing in the world. And there's no way that you could be doing what you're doing if you went that route. And I just, I just wanted to let you know, like, I feel that in my heart that you are a mother to so many. Wow. That just gave me the chills. I know. Like I'm kind of fighting back tears a little bit because that was just so beautiful. And it's to get that validation from your mom, who was someone who had made you feel the exact opposite. And she only has one grandchild. She has three kids and one grandchild. My sister and I don't have children. And my sister always really wanted children. So it was really, it's so different because I never really wanted them until that two years where I went for it. But, um, I feel extremely fulfilled. I know a lot of stuff about lives that I've lived before and me not wanting children is, uh, makes a lot of sense to me based on what I know. Mm. Cause once you start going really deep in meditation, you start healing things from other lives. So I've, I've healed the loss of children in this life from other lives, right? So I won't go too off the rails with this, but just know that this all makes so much sense to me. I want to get a, do that kind of meditation. (laughs) I want to know that stuff. Some people do not want to know. Yeah, well, it just, it comes, I don't look for it. It comes and it comes in wisdom and knowings. Mm -hmm. I call them knowings where there's just no question. It's not, Mm -hmm. I don't read about it. I don't, it it comes to me in an instant Mm -hmm. and in an instant comes a lifetime of information. So that's kind of where I am. I feel extremely fulfilled. I feel like I am mothering and, and meaning like I am nurturing so much from Yogi Triathlete to my dog Clark, to the students that I work with, to, uh, to my husband <laughs> and nurturing him, out. nurturing him in a way where He's I am looking have, lovingly at you. Yeah. But nurturing him in a you. way where I have stepped back mm-hmm. and allowed him to be fully expressed on his path, whether that yeah. means suffering or not. But I don't want to hug though. I want to get the guy's perspective on this. My guy. No yeah. kids, huh? No kids. Yeah. yeah. Cause you know, it, we make it seem like it's the wife's decision, the woman's decision, but it's not. Mm-mm. It's a partnership. Yeah, and I came from I came from a big family. I have there's five siblings in my in my um, household, and I'm definitely the one who's not 
the group. Like I could really be the one who's adopted if you look at my family. Yeah. And as I can reflect now on it, it's just there were signs there all along that I would go off and do my own thing. I was always, you know, running or, or driving to just get out of the house or do something on my own. And I think growing up, I knew, like, I, we ba- I babysat a lot. So I knew, like, I had these... Bitch is amazing with children. Yeah. I, I need I- a babysitter during <laughs> Iron Man, but you're racing it. I'm volunteering. Kids before Iron Man. Wait, I'm volunteering with Wilder at Aid Station 9, the run, the run awesome. station. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So, okay, keep going. So, yeah. Moving so on. I just had that feeling of I can, yeah. I can watch kids. Like, I get it. Like, I can, I have that instinct inside of me. But it never came to the point of I want to win for myself. Like, I just, it, I don't think it ever, even when we were trying, and we just talked about this, like, I don't think we were ever, or I was ever fully on board. Like, there was, like, I was riding the trainer, and I was riding the hardest seat, you know, I could I could ride. Purposely. Yeah. Subconsciously. I could sit on the trainer for six hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I need to have sex at 545 tonight. <laughs> the timing's perfect. But I just never, I never felt it. But what I did feel is that I feel that power inside that, I needed to work on myself because for me, I had so much stuff to do on myself first before I could, I could help out others. This is just my yeah. perspective. And now as things come together, as I'm coaching a 10 year old, like I coached her to her first like triathlon, I can see like why I'm supposed to be here. And we met, or I had a session with a spiritual person and they told me I would be coaching kids at some point in my life. So to the fact that I don't have one myself, I feel like yeah. I will have one when I coach. And my athletes, I consider my children. And the students that I teach in yoga, something I never, ever thought I would ever do is stand in front of people, 30 people, and, and bring them through a yoga flow, not knowing what sequence I'm going to do, and speak from the moment, and speak to what I see, and, and raise the vibration so that people are smiling and, and coming up after class and saying, like, what you said just connected with me and now Mm -hmm. I can go home and carry this like those are the moments that I feel like all this work I've done and invested in myself are going to shine and so I I don't have any regrets like Jess said we we do you know we do have nieces and nephews and we give them all our love and you don't have to have kids to feel fulfilled in your life in all ways yeah you know you don't you don't not at all And uh, the fact that we had one, it shook up our life so much. There are times that I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no freedom, you know, and you have Mm. to constantly reframe. But so I think there's, but at the end of the day, like the goal is to just never have regrets. It's, it's a, it's a wasted emotion. It's wasted energy. It is because you can't go back. The past does not exist. Mm -hmm. It vanished into nothingness the moment that it happened. That's already passed. Yeah. And it, if you it know, you, you want to live from that hub. And My that cereal takes, is the past. I know. We never now talked gone. about the cereal. <laughs> I want to, I want to finish with a question to you. So we touched upon this at the beginning and you know, how do you find balance? What's balance to you? Because mm. you got a lot going on, girl. Yeah. Mom, wife, yeah. entrepreneur athlete, you know, letting go of things, bringing on things. What's balance to you? Um, I don't see it as balance because I, in my head, imagine a teeter totter and that it never really balances. And like, you might find a little balance and then there's like an inch, the wind blows and suddenly you're off. So I just think of my life as constantly shifting priorities and my goal is always to keep things aligned. We talked about alignment with who I am and what's important to me. The trick is that the who I am and what's important to me is also constantly changing. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I have a nonprofit now. It's called Running Start. We help women change their lives through running. We just had a big push with that. That needed to come to the surface more. Skirt sports, huge part of my life. Um, wilder, huge part of my life. Oh, what about my husband? Yeah, if you look behind you, I have like three goals on a piece of paper. And the bottom one, plan and commit to day dates with Tim. That one's currently being neglected. That needs to come to the surface more. You know, like... I love how they're day dates because who wants to go out at night? (laughs) No. Oh, yeah. And I actually wrote day dates, didn't I? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I... There's a practical uh, strategy I use, which is literally list making daily. 
and I look at my list and I reprioritize and certain things come up. And it's also an ability to allow myself to not get some stuff done sometimes and to just breathe and say, I'm only one person. Like I can only do what I can do. And if I'm disappointing other people, we need to get that out and figure out why, and then figure out if that needs to come to the surface or I just need to move on from it. Right. So balance, schmalance, I don't know, not super, um, I'm not super, uh, I don't feel very connected to that word, but shifting, constantly moving, and then constantly making sure that the things I do are aligned with where I am. Yeah. That's I think, how I approach it. I think it. that's balance. And I'm starting to see balance as more of flexibility. Mm. Cause when things it's a are great flexible, way to say right, it. they're always molding. And again, yep. like we're, there's no stasis in this life. So yep. I think we find balance in every moment by just being in that moment and then moving on to whatever's next. All right. Well then I'm going to end on my final question. Okay. So, and this can come from either of you or both. If you can give our listeners one final nugget, one piece of advice to help them run their worlds in a bigger and better way, what would it be? Whoa. All right. So I think oh, bigger, better. I think you just have to look around wherever you are and ask yourself if all these things, because there's going to be a lot of things no matter where you are. Do, do they make you happy and do you need them all? Could you get, could you remove one thing today? Just one thing. Could be a glass, could be a t-shirt. And would that change your happiness or the way that you look at life? I freaking love it. <laughs> it's about happiness. It's about what you truly need. It's about loving yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, group hug. <laughs> Good luck at Ironman. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, I can't yeah. wait to see you out there. Wilder gives like really good energy handoffs. Eight I'll station be, nine. Yeah, I'll be volunteering with food or drink. She'll be giving hand slaps. Okay. Sweet. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so Love much. Love you. We're going to do this every time we come here. Every we're time. Do this every week. Every week. Wait. <laughs> That's a whole every different week. podcast. It's all on. Da boom. She rocks, right? I love this woman so much, and I would love to collaborate more with her in support of her incredible movement to empower women. So I'm letting that stuff marinate, and I'm sure Nicole's listening to this, so you do the same, Nicole. All right, you guys, thanks so much for showing up to the pod this week. Check out the show notes for ways to connect with Nicole. We are Yogi Triathlete Holistic Performance. We are triathlon and run training, meditation and mindfulness, yoga and plant-based nutrition. We are on a mission to create a better world by assisting those athletes who are ready to step up to their fullest potential and live the awake and ready life. We only get one shot here, people, and life is just a series of moments. Just like our breath, they come and they go, and we never get them back. All we have is the moment we are in, and when we can show up to that moment fully and sit in the hub of our reality where we can see all of the truths about how we really move through the world, we not only lift the veil of delusion, but we lift every limit and we give space for our fullest potential to unleash.